name is Edward Wood. I was born March the 15th of 1927 in Clay County, Alabama. Growing on a farm, we were known as sharecroppers. We did a lot of cropping, but we did very little sharing. Somehow the landlord managed to take what you made. We suppose have gotten half of what you made, but you paid your bills out of your half, and by the time you finished paying your bill, there was nothing left. This is my daddy, John Wood, and two brothers, Harmon and Norman. One of them died when he was two years old. The other one died just a few years ago. Well, my daddy was actually born a slave. He was born February the 17th in 1861, and his master was his daddy. He owned my grandmother on my daddy's side, and he had two children by her, and uh, he, was in, he was from Hurd County, Georgia, by way of Texas. He moved into Randolph County, Alabama, and uh, when he died, my dad and his sister inherited his land. My dad died in 1939. I was 12 years old. I was one of 12 children at home at the same time. My dad was married twice. He had 10 boys and two girls by his first wife, nine boys and three girls by my mother. So there was a pretty good crowd of us. We had a pretty hard time. My mother had a problem trying to keep food on the table. Even though we were on the farm, we mostly raised cotton, and then you can't eat cotton. So we had a pretty hard time. I wound up being a hunter, and many days I'd be in the woods hunting, and if I didn't kill something, there'd be no meat on the table. So I love the sport, and uh, I still hunt. Well, you can see what I've been doing. I like to hunt, I like to fish. When I was growing up, many times if we didn't kill something, there'd be no meat on the table. So I not only like to hunt, but I like the meat. I don't leave it in the woods, I use it. I give away a lot. I remember when I killed this bobcat, I was turkey hunting that morning, and when I got on my stand, this bobcat came along and I killed it. So I had a pretty good idea I wouldn't see a turkey that day. We had a lot of problems during those times. Everywhere you looked, everything pointed to white. Even the movies, the good guys wore white hats, the bad guys wore black hats. In the community where I grew up, we did not. Have, there was not a school for blacks. At least there was not a building. I went to school in a church with from 40 to 60 students, one teacher from grade one through six, and when you finished the sixth grade, there was nowhere else to go. The nearest high school was 28 miles, and there was no busing for black students. So some of the children went through the sixth grade two or three times because there was nowhere else to go. This is my son, Edward Jr., and his wife, Rose. These are my grandchildren. This is Yolanda, the oldest daughter. She has finished Alabama uh, A&M in Huntsville, and she's living in Montgomery now, working on her master's. This is Unique, who is just about to finish college in Chattanooga. That's where they live. And this is Edward III, who has finished high school and just about to enroll in Tennessee Tech. My daddy had died. I had an older brother, Monroe, who took over. He was still in his late teens. But he took the business and sort of took care of us to see that we worked and to see that we was in at a certain time at night. And uh, none of us had ever been in jail. And that many boys, I think that's, that's, that's something to speak of. We had never cleared any money, actually, that I can recall until the year that the fall after my daddy died in the spring, and we cleared several hundred dollars. 
and my brother and the landlord had some words. In fact, he didn't want to give my brother what we had actually earned. So his son settled with my brother, and it was 28 miles from where we lived to town where they sold the cotton. So the landlord left my brother, and he had to walk home, and he came to our house and told my mother that he wanted her to take them little niggers and get off of his property as soon as she could get away. And he called her a real bad name and offered to slap her, and I grabbed him around the legs, and he kicked me several times. So I grew up full of hate. I had laid awake many nights as I was growing up thinking how I could get revenge. Just before I went in the military, I was out hunting that day. It was just a few days before I was to go in the military. When I got home, my mother was crying, and uh, I asked her what the problem was, and she said that this landlord had been there and he'd been waiting for me. He wanted to tell me how sorry he was about kicking me and cursing her. And I said, you some bad words. I said, you let him in the house? And she said, yes. And I said, well, I wouldn't have let him in if I'd have been here, I'd have killed him. And she said, you're going to have to get some of that hate out of you. And uh, you're going to have to love this landlord whose name I won't call. And I said, I'll die and go to hell before I love him. She said, well, that's exactly what you're going to do unless you get some of that hate out of you. Well, I went through the military and I thought about him every day, how I could get revenge. And when I came home, and of course I did not understand it at the time, but as I said, I was the last of the four brothers who were discharged, being the youngest one. The oldest brother had bought a new car and he just insisted on carrying me for a ride. Well. Even before I could change clothes, he wanted to take me for a ride in his new car, and I agreed. So he went straight to this landlord, which was about 12 or 14 miles from where we had, where we were living at the time. The landlord was sitting along the highway under a shed. His son-in-law ran a store, and the old man was sitting under the shed and he did not recognize me. When my brother stopped the car and we got out, he recognized my brother, but he didn't recognize me. And so my brother said, this is Edward. And the old man got up and he said, Edward, I'm glad that God let me live long enough to see you. I want to apologize. I want to ask your forgiveness. So God has dealt with me since that time. He said, I've lost everything I had. I lost my farm. I lost my wife. I carried her to Walter Reed Hospital. I spent all of my money. I don't even have anywhere to live. I live in the house with my son-in-law. And he said, I want you to forgive me. I was wrong. And we hugged each other's neck, and both of us cried out a lot of hate that day. I didn't know, and I've talked to my brother many times, why, of all places, he's going to take me for a ride. Why did he go there? He said, I have no idea, but I know now why he went there, because God sent him. God sent him there just as sure as I'm sitting in this chair, because God had something for me to do, and he had something for the landlord to do. So I won't ever forget that time, and I know why I went there. It was just like you lifted this chair off of my back when that hate came out of me. It was just like you took a load off of me, and I never, ever will ever stoop to that level again to hate anybody. Now, there are people who I feel sorry for, but I don't hate them, and I won't hate them. This is Venetia, my granddaughter. She's living in Iraq. And uh, this is my grandson, Dante. They are sisters and brothers. He's on his second tour in Afghanistan. His first tour, he was uh, a door gunner on a helicopter and he decided he wanted to be the pilot so when he came home he went down to Fort Rooker and got his wings and he's back over there now as a pilot on a Chinook. He's in the National Guard but he works full time for the National Guard 
And this is a picture of myself in World War II. I spent a little time in the Navy and the Pacific. I went close enough to Guam, I could see the island, but there was so much activity out there, we couldn't get off the ship. I went in the military in 1946, I believe it was, and uh, I had three brothers already in the military, World War II. Uh, there was two of us brothers in the Navy. One was in the Army and one was in the Marine Corps. I was on an aircraft carrier, two aircraft carriers. That, as a matter of fact, the USS Natoma Bay and the USS Mission Bay. I went to Guam, to Manila, Suvi Bay, and all down in the Philippines. At one time, I didn't think there was any more land. For 21 days, I didn't see anything except sky and water. For a little country boy who was just off the farm, that was quite exciting. But when I went in the military and came home on my first furlough, I went to town and everybody in the country go to town on Saturday afternoon. Well, I was pretty proud of my uniform and I met one of the local farmers and uh, he was a landowner and uh, he asked me where I stole that uniform. And I said, well, I didn't steal it, Uncle Sam put it on me. And he said, uh, you better pull that uniform off. He said, ain't no niggas in the Navy, you better pull it off before some of these white folks pull it off of you. I said, well, you're white. But he decided he didn't want to pull it off of me. But even before then, uh, on my way home on my furlough, the buses that I rode had a white line there was a few seats behind the white line for blacks. And if there was vacant seats in front of the white line, even though there were vacant seats, you had to stand up. If all of the few seats behind the white line was full, there was nowhere for you to go except to stand up. Even though there were vacant seats in front, here I am with a uniform on fighting for my country, yet I couldn't sit down because it was in front of the white line. I personally came to Anniston in 1951. I got married and I had a family and I went to high school after I had a family and was working two jobs trying to pay for a home. That's the high school and I got. Back to the time when I was school age, we had one teacher and sometimes the teacher only had a high school diploma. As I said, everywhere you looked, it was white. Blacks went around to the back doors, the whites went in the front doors, and if I drove from my home to Florida, if I had to use the bathroom, or my wife had to use the bathroom, she just had to get outside of the road. There was no facilities for black people. You could buy gas, but you couldn't use the bathroom. There was no work in the area except farming, and I did not want to go back to farming. So I came to Anniston, I got a job in private industry, and I commuted back and forth for about 38 or 39 miles every day. And I got tired of that, so I took a room here in Anniston, met and married my wife, and been here ever since. Black people lived in West Anniston for the most part, and white people lived in East Anniston. We had a few blacks lived in South Anniston, but I like West Anniston because it was alive. In fact, 15th Street was wide open. Fort McClellan was booming, and many soldiers, and I kind of liked the excitement, so I took a room on West 15th Street. I hunted and fished, and on weekends, I I did what most people do. I went to a club or went to church on Sundays and just the normal thing, nothing exciting. Till I met my wife and uh, we married in June. I bought a house in September. Got laid off in November and things got pretty hairy there for a while, but we survived. I can tell you a story about her. When I met my wife, I had a terrible cold. It was in the month of March in 1953. And my wife was a nurse and a midwife. At that time, she was working for a doctor. 
and I had a terrible cold, so I went to the doctor's office, and I didn't really know the doctor. I had heard him, I knew him by reputation, but I'd never met him. And he stuck his head in the door, he come running in, so I gotta go to Montgomery, I'll be back later. And just was gone that quick. I was had been there for a few minutes and was talking to my wife. It wasn't my wife at the time. And she said, that was the doctor. I had told her that I had a cold. She said, I can give you a penicillin shot if, if you want me to give you a shot and you can come back tomorrow and see the doctor if you know better. And I said, okay. And uh, so I started getting my sleeve up. She started fixing the syringe and she said, I'm gonna give it to you in the hip. I said, no, give it to me in the arm. She said, I'm the nurse, I'll give it to you in the hip. And I just dropped my pants and three months later we were married. <laughs> I didn't think too much of her attitude at the time. So I didn't see her again. I didn't go back to the doctor the next day. I didn't need to. The penicillin shop did its job. That was in March, and along about May, a friend of mine that we were working together knew my wife, and his lady friend and my wife later got to, was good friends, and they were having a little dinner or something, and he said, hey, come on, go with me tonight. If you're not tied up, I'm going uh, to a dinner at a friend's, and uh, this friend is saying a woman. I had no idea it was my wife. He didn't tell me who it was, and I didn't ask him. But I said, okay, I'm not doing anything. And uh, so I went with him, and as it turned out, it was at my wife's apartment. And when I saw her, I didn't feel too good because uh, we didn't, you know, there was no communication between us, but we ate dinner, and uh, we had a casual conversation, and then later on, I got to thinking about it, and I called her, and we began to communicate. And in June, now from March to June, I got up one Monday morning. I had been doing some thinking about her, and I was 25 years old, and I called her, and I said, you want to get married today? <laughs> she said, I'm supposed to go to work. I said, uh, if I can find somebody to work in my place. And she said, come on down. And uh, she hadn't even gotten out of bed when I called. It was real early in the morning. So I went down to her apartment and uh, went in, and she called a couple of people and got a lady to work in her place. And so we went to Talladega at Citizen Hospital, you can get your blood tested and get all of this stuff done and get the result that day. You don't have to wait to send the blood off. And that was a long time ago, but most places you did. So we got a blood test and we got back in the car. I drove to Ashland, Alabama, which is about 20 miles, I guess, or better. And got a justice of the peace and got married and came back to Aniston. <laughs> It was just like that. There was no in-between. It was from, I won't say hate, but I didn't much like her attitude, and I don't think she cared much about mine, but uh, we were able to stay together 43 years and raise five children, so we must have done something right. <laughs> but it was, it was just like that. She would not take no for an answer. For instance, when... Uh, found that little house that I bought. I told you we got married in June and bought a house in September and I got laid off in November. But she wanted a house. And uh, I, I wanted a house too, but I wasn't able to buy one and she found that house and I didn't like it. And she did. And uh, so she insisted that, and I, I just heard house until I didn't want to hear house no more. In fact, I told her when I got up to go to work, I said, look, I don't want that house. I don't have anything to buy it with. I'm not able to buy it. I don't want you to say house to me anymore. And when I came in for work that afternoon, I won't ever forget, she met me at the door and she was saying, house, house, house. She just made a song. <laughs> she was stubborn. She was very, very stubborn. And uh, we bought the house. Ha, 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 ha.
The contract that we put in water lines, sewer lines, gas lines, uh, and then rebuild Fort McClellan. We poured tent pads, built sidewalks and doorsteps and streets, this kind of thing. I did not have to do a lot of pick and shovel jobs because I knew where to get the parts that we were gonna need. The supervisor and I became real good friends. A man from Mississippi, as a matter of fact, one of the nicest people I've ever known. Not just because he gave me a break, but because he was human and he knew what it meant to be poor. He would go many times and leave me in charge. I worked that job until I got a better job. It didn't pay that much, but I got a job at uh, one of the local plants. Uh, some people refer to them as pipe shop. Uh, this happened to be a water pipe plant that paid more money than I made, so I worked there for a while, and then I left there and went to Anniston Army Depot, worked for the federal government until I retired. They had what they call white jobs and black jobs, and we pretty well knew that we was not going to be hired for what they call a white job. So some of us, rather than to be embarrassed, just didn't apply for those jobs. We worked in the foundry, for instance, where I worked. I went to the shop on a job as a painter, and I was elected as a union steward, and of course we had two unions at the time. One was all white, and the other one was all black. We had one incident that I remember quite well that they cut the production 50% and laid off one of the workers. and. Uh, the complaint was that they put more work on the one person who was left. The company contended that we cut the production 50%, so you're not doing any more work than you were doing. Well, they had what they call a coal maker and a helper. They cut the helper off, which means the coal maker had to make the core and do the part that the helper was doing, even though he only did 50%. He had never had to clean a core. This is what the helper did. He had never had to lift the core. This was the helper's job. All of the core maker had to do was make the core. The helper did everything else. And they had met repeatedly and was not making any progress. So one of the white union members and I were pretty good friends, even though we did not represent white employees, he asked if I would sit in on the grievance. And the company was just, they were just contending that you're not doing any more work. And on the surface, it seems that way, that if you're making 100 widgets with two people, you take one off and cut it to 50 widgets, you're, you're not putting any more work on them. But they contended that it was. So I sat there and listened to the argument, and there was a adding machine, a great big machine sitting on the table. <clears throat> and the personnel manager, the president of the plant, and all of the power that be was sitting on one side of the table. The union was sitting on the other side of the table. So I asked the personnel manager to take that adding machine and sit it on the desk, which was the same level. He took it and sat it on the desk. And I said, now take it and sit it on the floor and he took it and set it down on the floor. I said, now lift it up and put it back on the table where it was. And I said, at what point now did you exert the most energy when you set that machine over on the desk, which is on the same level, or when you set it down on the floor, or when you picked it up and put it back on the table? And he said, when I set it down on the floor, of course, and picked it up again. I said, well, that's exactly the point that we're trying to make. This core maker has never put his hand on a core. He has never had to clean it. He's never had to sit it down in a container. He never had to lift it. All he did was make it and swing it out of the machine on the same level. So I won the grievance because you're putting more work. You're having the core maker do work that he had never done before. 
So the president said to me, when the meeting is over, I want you to stay in. I want to talk to you. And that's when he offered me a job as a supervisor. So I took the job, and my boss, of course, objected. But I, I am very proud of the fact that of the five years that I supervised, I never had a grievance filed against me, and it was not unusual for most of the other supervisors to get three or four grievances a week. But I never in the five years had a grievance filed against me. There's been disagreements, and there were times when I had to talk to people, but we was always able to settle the problem without a grievance. I never had a grievance filed against me. After I started raising a family, my son, Edward Jr., was, oh, I guess about four or five years old. I went to one of the local drugstores that had a lunch counter, and my son wanted a hamburger, and I could not buy a hamburger because they didn't serve black people. The pharmacist was in the back of the drugstore, and the lunch counter was about halfway in. He saw people eating hamburgers. Well, he knew I had enough money to buy a hamburger, yet I could not tell him why he couldn't have one. So he started crying, and I just picked him up in my arms and went, walked out the door. And about the time I got to the door, somebody hollered and said, do you want something, boy? And I said, no. And I walked out the door, and I have not been able to tell him till this day why he could not have a hamburger. But I made a vow that day. I had lived through a lot of segregation and discrimination. But I said that day, if I ever get a chance to do something about this, I'm gonna do it. And when the time came and Dr. King started his movement, I joined right away. And I was one of the first ones who sat at a lunch counter in Anniston, Alabama. There was three stores in Anniston that had lunch counters. And there were six of us, a man named Dr. Gordon Rogers, a woman named Annie Mae Moloch, a minister named Davis, and a man named Farrell, one of the Farrell brothers, and another man named G.E. Smitherman and myself integrated the three lunch counters that was in Anniston at that time. We were not arrested. In fact, we didn't have any problems. Uh, there was a lot of people who looked at us and pointed at us and said things, but nobody offered to touch us. So we had coffee and food and then another cup of coffee and nobody didn't bother us. This is one of the historical sites in Anniston, Alabama. This is Leonard's Barbershop. A fellow named Joe Leonard used to own this. He's dead now. He and his brother and a minister, Reverend Green, and the two Leonard brothers. And when I first came to Anniston, this is where I got my first haircut. Somebody told me, say, go to Leonard's Barbershop. So I walked in and I said, who is Joe Leonard here? Nobody said a word. All three of the barbers looked at me and Finally, when Joe's chair became vacant, he said, come on, mister, I'll cut your hair. Never said another word the whole time. Cut my hair, and hair cut wasn't but 50 cents. So I gave him a dollar and told him to keep the change, and he followed me all the way out to the street, brushing the hair off of him. He said, come back, I'm Joe, I'm old Joe Leonard. Come back anytime. <laughs> so, so I got my hair cut chair up until he died, and the barbershop closed, but we got somebody else that's opened it up now. But he was one of the finest men that I have ever known, the man that ran this barbershop. I don't guess he had an enemy in the world. And when I first came to Anniston, I met a doctor, he was a dentist, named Gordon Rogers, he's dead now. We became friends right away, and uh, remained friends until a few years ago when he died. But he, at that time, was president of the NAACP Alabama chapter. Well, they outlawed the NAACP in the state of Alabama. And this was before the SCLC was born. So we organized a club that we called the Anniston Progressive Club. Our main objective was to get black people, especially registered to vote. And we were 
fairly successful. Uh, we had committees that the organization grew into quite a few people. And we had committees. We had one we called an employment committee. And I served on that one in addition to knocking on doors and asking people to get registered to vote. I talked to merchants about hiring black people in responsible jobs, and we were fairly successful. Some of them, in fact, the majority of them said, yes, we'll hire black people. Sure, we'll hire them. Send us some qualified. Well, when they put the application in, they wasn't qualified. This is how they got by without hiring black because they said, oh, you're not qualified for that. And at that time, you could walk in a bank or any other public building for that matter, but especially banks, the only black you saw was probably vacuuming a rug or mopping the floor. And the day when I walk in the bank where I do my little business, I see as many black clerks as I do white clerks, and it just blesses my soul to see and to know that I may have had a little something to do with this because I spent a lot of time. I worked at the pipe shop from 8 to 12 and sometimes 15 hours, and then I would knock on doors until bedtime and ask people to get ready to the vote, and we even had a little treasure, and we would, if they didn't have transportation, we'd pay a cab fare to get them to vote. And then when the SCLC came along, I joined the SCLC, and it was, like I said, we integrated the four lunch, three lunch counters that was in Anniston, and uh, Dr. Rogers and I, we finally was able to get enough votes to get him elected to the city commission, which was unheard of. There's never been a black. He was the first one. And uh, our effort, through our effort, we was able to get him elected. So we was able to accomplish quite a bit, I would say. And uh, I feel pretty good about it. And like I say, when I walk down the street now, as a matter of fact, I went to my bank yesterday and I was amazed that the people, good morning, Mr. Wood. How you doing, Mr. Wood? There was a time when I could have gone in the bank and they would wait on everybody else before they wait on me. They'd holler, it, uh, when they get down to where there was nobody else, then they waited on me. But uh, we've seen quite a few changes. And I think everybody has been helped, not just black people. I think it helped everybody, white and black. And I, I must say this, that even during the time that it was segregated and we were discriminated against, there was a lot of white people that didn't agree with this, but this was the law. The law said that segregated, we have to have this. But I had white friends even when I was a kid. We hunted together, fished together, we played together. I still got a lot of white friends. You know, it's a strange thing. I thought about it a lot of times. You could get on an elevator and you could just get as close as you could get, just like sardine, but you couldn't sit down together. Black women worked in white people's kitchens and when they put their hands all in the dough to make the biscuits, to cook the bread, to cook everything, and then when they got it all prepared, they had to get over in the corner on a little table to eat. They could not sit down with the people and eat with them, but they could cook the meal. Seemed a little strange, doesn't it? Dr. Martin Luther King spoke at the church where I attend on at least two occasions. 17th Street Baptist Church was sort of the headquarters for the SCLC here in Anniston. And of course, Dr. King, along with a lot of other leaders, spoke. And when he would come to Anniston, I was one of the ones who would escort him, pick him up at the airport, take him to the church, then take him back to the airport. And uh, he was, uh, quite a person, or quite a man. I, I never seen anybody that influenced me as much as he did. Just the short time that I was around him and listened to him speak, there was something different about him. Uh, I can't describe the feeling that would come over me when I was in his presence. He was 
a man with a lot of wisdom. And I remember on one occasion that I spoke to him about the nonviolence. And I said, I'm not sure that I could sit and let somebody actually beat me without retaliating. And he listened to what I said, and finally he said, uh, Brother Wood, there's room in the organization for everybody. He taught nonviolence, no matter what, don't retaliate. Love is the answer. And of course, I've lived long enough now that I can understand things that I used to couldn't understand. That love is something that's irresistible. You just keep on loving. Let people do what they want to do. Smile is the most contagious thing that you have. Just keep on loving. There was a gentleman, a black man, that used to own this place. It's called Morris's Service Station, Morris and Ray's Service Station and the Ku Klux Klan shot in this place several times. They did not actually hit anybody, but they drove by and fired on this service station more than once. And Edward Morris was one of the strong civil rights workers during the period of civil rights struggle. They buried him just a year ago. Uh, he just died, then his wife died a few months later. So they both gone now, but he ran this station here for many, many years. I joined the Masons uh, during that period, and I lived in West Anniston, and the Masonic Hall was in South Anniston, which was quite a few miles. I didn't own a car in those days, so unless somebody picked me up, I walk from West Anniston to South Anniston because I refused to get in the back of a bus. Sometime a friend would pick me up, sometime I'd walk, I'd get a cab. But I was one of the first ones who sat on the front seat of a bus in Anniston, Alabama. And uh, I'm not boasting, but it's just a fact of life, and uh, I'm pretty proud of that. When I came to Anniston, there were a fellow named Adams, Kenneth Adams, he ran a service station out further west Anniston, out beyond where I lived. He served only gas and oil, but he did not serve black people. He had signed up, we serve white customers only. And he went to that, from that to three others. He had four service stations, one on every entrance into Anniston. And it had signs up on all of them. We serve white customers only. Black people in Anniston did not stop at those stations because they knew better. And people traveling, coming into Anniston and not aware of this, many black people would pull into one of those stations and many of them were beaten terribly bad because they did not see the sign and uh, yet they were not allowed to stop there. There were some churches shot into here. Uh, the church where I attended, which was sort of a headquarters for the civil rights movement, we stood guard 24 hours a day around that church. Uh, I took turns and the other people took turns. And there was somebody there continuously around the clock. So that church was never fired on, which was 17th Street. Mount Olive was one of the churches that was fired on. The parsonage was fired into, and uh, it got it got pretty bad. Yet, it was not as bad in Anniston as it was in Montgomery and Selma and some of the other southern states. But uh, Calhoun County was very fortunate because we had a city council here, a mayor named Claude Deere, and a commissioner named Miller Sproul, and they appointed a biracial committee during the time that it got real bad, along with Dr. Philip Noble. He was chairman of the group, 
and my pastor, who was Nimrod Reynolds at that time, and a friend of mine who was another minister named G.E. Smitherman and another minister named McLean. They were the committee and they added to that committee and they were able through their negotiations and through their contact with the business leaders, Aniston was very fortunate to have those persons and it saved a lot of hardship. A lot of violence was avoided because of their effort. There were people who had made some remarks that uh, you're all just making the white people hate us, go home, and some of them would close the door. Uh, they refused to go and get registered because it was not easy even though it was easier to get registered in Anniston than it was in some of the southern counties. Uh, I personally got registered to vote after I came to Anniston. Office that was the board of registered that would hold seven people. They had a table with seven chairs. They had in the courthouse three benches. Each one of those benches would hold seven people. Well, when I got registered, all of the benches was full and the board was full. I was the only black out of all of the 28 people. And somebody, I don't know who he was, a white man would come along and say, boy, what you waiting on? And I said, I'm waiting to get ready to vote. They're not gonna get to you, you might as well go on. I said, well, I got plenty of time, I'll wait. So when the seven would come out of the board, the first bench would move in and the second bench would move up to the first one and the last one. And each time I would move from one bench to the other, the same man would always make it a point to point me out. He'd say, come and say, but they aren't going to get to you. Why don't you go on? You know, they aren't going to get to you today. So, well, I got plenty of time. And if they don't get to me today, I'll be back tomorrow. So I got registered, which was not really much of a problem for me. As a matter of fact, I think they accepted to get me out of the way, but I got registered to vote anyway. <laughs> so. Willie Brewster was a black man who lived out in the Ohatchee area that worked at one of the local plants. And they were getting off from work that was around close to midnight. And they stopped at a service station to get some gas. And when they pulled away from the service station, I understand there was a car following them and he was fired on and they shot Willie Brewster back of the head and killed him. And on that same night, at the courthouse, there was a Klan's leader named Connie Lynch from somewhere in Georgia that was speaking. And the last thing he said, according to the paper, was, let's go kill some niggers. And I'm sure Connie Lynch went home and went to bed. And some of those people he was talking to thought that he really meant to kill some niggers, so they killed Willie Brewster that night. One of them, actually, I think, was actually killed and did not actually live long enough to go to prison. But I think one of the others was sentenced, but whether he actually went to prison, I don't remember. Well, this was in later years. I was fishing that day, my son and I, and uh, we left fishing, and down on the side of the highway, there was, I guess, 200 with hoods on. They had an open meeting. It was on Saturday afternoon. And I've seen, seen the Klan in more instances than that in Birmingham. And Anniston was not as wide open as some of the other areas. Uh, this incident happened, and there were other instances, but as far as just rallying and walking the street and demonstrating, we didn't see much of that in Anniston.
We all belonged to the same club, and there was things that was happening that we didn't know about, the average member. N.Q. Reynolds, who was my pastor at the time, and uh, McLean had, I guess I could use the word, negotiated with the power that be that they were going to integrate the library at a given time. It was in the early 60s, but I, I can't remember what year. Even though we were all members of the same club, the membership was not aware that this was going to happen. They kept this top secret. They had negotiated, I understand, with the police and with the library board and whoever was in charge that they were going to integrate the library. They were going to go in and check out some book at a given time. And nobody, nobody was supposed to have known this. But somehow or another, when they got to the library, there was close to 200 people waiting and uh, they were beaten very bad, shot at, and almost killed. They barely got out with their life. But somebody, somebody talked. I don't know who, because I didn't, was not aware that there was uh, going to integrate, the, not me, but just me, but none of the members of the club knew about it. They're just the officials. How did I feel? Mm -hmm. Pretty bad. As a matter of fact, uh, as I said earlier, I'm a hunter, and it was almost hunting season. So we would go out in the country and get permits from landowners to hunt on their property when the season opened up. And it just so happened that this particular day, several of us was down in Clay County asking for permits to hunt on landowner's place. I grew up in the area, so I knew a lot of the farmers. And if they gave us permission, we'd do a little scouting around to see the, where the land lines was and what the area looked like. <laughs> One of the people who was in the crew had a CD radio, and he heard this instant on his CB. So we came back to Anniston uh, as soon as we heard what had happened at the library and met at 17th Street Church, which was sort of our headquarters. And uh, there was, oh, three or 400 people met there. And Reverend McLean, who was one of the people who was beaten, Reynolds was beaten worse than McLean, so he was home in bed. And in order to keep down violence or whatever might have happened, McLean preached that night, and uh, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon quite like. But he was able to calm the people down, and after the service was over, people went home and went to bed. That was a blessing. I had made friends with quite a few white and blacks, for that matter, but. One person in particular that worked in the office, and this was during the civil rights struggle, I was marching and sitting in, and he was aware of it, that I was active in the civil rights movement. So that particular morning, he was waiting at the clock, which we had to clock in and clock out. And when you walked into the foundry, there was a, a hole, a walkway about probably six feet wide. And when you clocked in and turned to go into the foundry, there were two drinking fountains. One was colored and one was white. He was standing at the clock and he said, Wood, I want to ask you a question. He said, uh, I think I know you well enough to ask you. Yes, you can ask me anything you want to and I'll answer you one way or the other. So he said, what is this civil rights movement? What is all the marching and the sitting in and all? What is this, what is it about? And I said, well, I'm glad you asked me. I said, you see those two drinking fountains? They were just a few steps from the clock. And he said, yes. I said, what do they say to you? He said, nothing. They've always been there I, I, ever since I've been here. And I, I don't question. I said, well, I do. 
They says to me every morning when I clock in and turn to go in the foundry, they say to me that I'm a little less than human. I can have the colored water, but I can't have the white water. I said, but it's much, much more than that. I said, that's just part of it. I said, what we want is to be able to get a decent job based on our qualification. We want to walk in a courtroom and be judged based on the evidence rather than on my color. When I walk in a courtroom and the judge look up and see I'm black, I'm automatically guilty. I said, we want to be treated just like any other American. I want a house that's decent. I want my children to go to a decent school. I want them to get a decent education. I want the same thing you want. I'm not an African, I'm an American. I was born in America and I fought for this country and I'm entitled to whatever this country have to offer. And that's what we are marching about. And he said, you know, I'm glad I asked you that. He said, I never thought about it. He said, I don't hate anybody. He said, I have nothing against you or anybody else. It's just the way the system is. And I, he said, and I don't question it. I said, well, I do. I said, this is the way the system is, but the system is wrong, and I have an opportunity now to help to get it right, and I'm doing everything I can to help to get it right. So we were friends then, and that's been 50 years ago, and we're still friends. The only thing we wanted to be was treated like any other American. And I've heard people make statements, if the blacks are not satisfied, let them go back to Africa. I've never been to Africa. I can't go back somewhere I've never been. I'm an American. I just happen to be in the sunshine a little too long. <laughs> but I'm as much an American as you are. I was born here. This is the only country I know. And I don't plan to go anywhere until the good Lord called me home. just a regular Sunday, 1961, Mother's Day, and uh, we knew that there was a civil rights bus coming through Anniston because it was in the news, in the papers, everybody was aware, it was no secret. They had a problem. When the bus got to Anniston, there was a group of people waiting on the bus. And I was aware that uh, it was the Klan behind it because they was just resisting giving black people equal rights. A lot of the riders were beaten. Uh, tires were slashed on the bus. Uh, they got off, some of them, and some of them weren't allowed to get off, but there was quite a problem at the Greyhound bus station here in Anniston. I was going to take my wife out to dinner, being Mother's Day. There was a place called the Ark. They serve some fantastic catfish. The good part about it, you didn't have to go inside. They had a drive-in with a high fence, wood fence, that you couldn't see over it. One side was for black, the other side was for white. Now the white could go inside if they wanted to, but if they wanted to drive around in the white side, they could do that. They had tables and benches and they had the same thing on the black side. So we'd go down and go in and sit in the car or sit, get out and sit on by a table on the bench and eat catfish. And I had no earthly idea. When I got out the highway a few miles, I run right up behind the bus. Forsyth grocery store sat right along there. There was no road there at the time. This was the only road that came through. And this is where the bus started burning and it burned down right by which is where you see that sign. And the bus had just stopped and smoke was beginning to come from the bus. And I realized there was a problem and I jumped out of my, pulled up and stopped and jumped out of my car. There were several car loads of white people and they made me get back in my car and, and, and get away from there. And I did, I got back in my car and drove down the road of, oh, 
half a mile, I guess, where I could find a place to turn around and came back. And when I got back, it was unbelievable how that bus had burned that fast. It had to be gasoline because I understand that they threw what we call Molotov cocktails on the bus. It's a bottle with a rag and gasoline. And the people, the passengers were laying all outside of the highway, crying and hollering, and it was not, not something that you want to see every day. It was just one of those things that, that happened that it brought about changes. And uh, I think they were good for both white and black. I'm thankful to God that I live long enough to see my grandchildren able to register at Jacksonville State or any other school based on their effort rather than their color. I'm happy that the opportunity is out there. I am very, very sad because some of our young people are not taking advantage of what I would have given my right arm for when I was a young person. And I think we as older black people are somewhat responsible because we have not really got the message over to our young people. Some of our young people actually frown at us older blacks because we allowed the situation to get to where it was. They don't know how much we suffered. They don't know the heartbreak that I had to face when I went to a place and had to go around to the back door before I was admitted. They don't have any idea what it's like to be turned away when all we were looking for was equal rights. Turned away from a job because of my color. Couldn't go into a public facility because of my color. They don't know how hard it was. They don't know how heartbreaking. And when I look today at the opportunities and I look at many young people who are not taking advantage, it really breaks my heart. I have enjoyed the people here uh, in my church. There are a lot of fine people in the community. And God has done something to me. And I know that. Uh, it didn't just happen. I'm 83 years old, and God did not have to keep me here, and I know that. And I know that each of us has a ministry. We're not all ministers but each of us has a ministry. And we are tied together, whether we like it or not. And I have made a point to try to set examples wherever I can. I would not be sitting here now if I did not think that what we've done here may help some young person. Many times we don't realize that it's not always we gotta go in our pocket. Sometimes a kind word. I've been to the point when I didn't care for myself. I didn't care anything about anybody else. I had absolutely nothing to look forward to. A friendly good morning. How do you feel this morning? Just the, that's all I need to change my whole being. I can do that. I don't have any money, but I can say good morning. I can smile. These are things that people need. These are things that I've needed and I need now. We're not made to live by ourselves. We are so connected. We have a relationship. God made us that way. What little I can do to promote the kingdom of God, and I've seen some changes in some people that I have been associated with, and I'm not trying to take any credit 
but I know there's something that I can do that's pleasing to God, and I must be doing something being 83 years old, and I cut my own grass, and uh, I do a lot of things. <laughs> and I credit him with all of it. And uh, I worry him to death, I know, but uh, that's what he wants us to do.